So you heard a lot from Angel about some of the things that are going on with containers and the reasons for doing it. Um, today, I'm happy to be here because I have an excuse to give away a bunch of our data for free every time I give a talk, uh, and so I no longer have to charge money for this stuff. Um, woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I also don't have to sell you anything, which is probably a good thing for you. Um, so I'm going to talk about cloud native in the enterprise. Uh, it's going to start a little bit high level, but then we're going to work in pretty quickly to uh, data on containers and microservices usage and a few examples of real world implementations, um, some of the problems they ran into, some of the reasons they made the shift, and some of the benefits they got out of it. Uh, so I, I give the stump pitch on sort of DevOps and cloud pretty regularly, and I dump basically all of that, because if you're here and you don't know what cloud is, you're probably in the wrong room. Uh, but I did want to start out with a couple of buzzwords, uh, because every conference I go to, inevitably vendors mention one or both of these somewhere in the keynote, because it's all about Docker, and now it's all, more recently it's all about microservices. And you know, in 2014, as, as a data point, uh, there was, at OSCON, one of my favorite open source conferences. Uh, this will soon be one of them next year, right? LinuxCon becomes the open source summit. Uh, there were zero, there was one talk in 2014 proposed on microservices, and in 2015 there were 30. So it's another one of these examples of things that come out of nowhere and suddenly become the only way to go forward. Uh, but it does show you how popular this, this stuff is getting. Um, the same thing, Glue, another good developer event. You know, there were zero talks in 2014, and it went to 12 one year later. Um, so this stuff is you know, getting a lot of hype. And whenever there's a trend happening with a bunch of hype going on, I always want to try and figure out what's the reality behind that. Um, how can we make this a little bit more concrete and figure out, you know, is this stuff that actually has value and that people are really implementing, or is this just um, something that you know, a bunch of vendors are going up on stage and pitching at their conferences? And so some of the high-level reasons for this, you know, you heard some of this from Angel, and I just wanted to show you a little bit of data on what we're seeing about the way IT shops think about technology and think about their priorities. And the important part of this slide, um, and at the bottom of the uh, end is the sample size, so we went out and asked more than 1,500 IT professionals and IT decision makers, what are their key priorities? And the important part is at the top, that blue and orange thing. Right? And that's the shift in priorities from those bottom three blocks, which are really about you know, cost-cutting, penny-pinching, to an approach that's focused much more around you know, collaborating with the business and investing in technology. In other words, becoming a software-defined company. As you see, you know, this dual approach of coupling you know, improved agility with decreased risk at the same time, what we see with things like microservices and like continuous delivery and like automation is you don't have to pick one of those. You don't have to go slow and stable or fast and break things. And we heard this you know, over the past couple of years from all kinds of people. Mark Zuckerberg is one funny example where you know, the Facebook motto used to be move fast and break things. And then at their conference, I think it was about a year and a half ago, they changed it to uh, one that was much less interesting but much more true, which was move fast with stable infrastructure. Doesn't have quite the same ring to it. But it's true. And you can relate this back to math, too. And I'm not going to have any time to go into that. But if you go back to the math of things like batch size, as you decrease batch size both horizontally from an architectural point of view and vertically from a continuous delivery point of view, you decrease the impact of any of the risks that happen while you decrease the queues as you push things out to production and you increase the agility you're able to have. And you know, I love the site, uh, the new stack. I'm glad they had that pancake breakfast this morning. Good stuff. Uh, but when I think about the new stack, I don't think about it as a single stack. Um, instead, it's an infinite array of possible stacks. Because I think fragmentation is one of the most important forces in technology today. It used to be back in the mid-90s, if you wanted to pick, if you wanted to say, hey, what languages will cover 90% of all the code that gets written? You'd come up with about three. But if you fast forward today and you say, all right, what, how many languages do I have to support if I want 90% of all the code to work on my platform, suddenly you're at something more like 10. Right? It's no longer C, C++, and Java is good enough. Um, suddenly you're tacking on Go and JavaScript and maybe Rust and you know, who knows what else, R, all kinds of stuff. And so this fragmentation is one of the things that I think is a driver, one of many drivers, along with the agility and the risk and all those other things, for microservices, because they let you 
pick whatever technology components are the best tools for the job for each job that has to be done, and then segment those across with APIs. And so I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this DevOps stuff. Like I said, I'm assuming that you mostly know and are deeply familiar, in fact, with most of it. Uh, but what I did want to show you was a little bit of data on where things are right now out there in the real world um, instead of inside of this you know, high-end tech bubble that we live in. And one of the big trends, and I'm sure you've probably heard this metaphor before, is this pets versus cattle idea of moving from you know, single servers that are handcrafted and artisanally maintained to something that is thought about in terms of herds and fleets and any individual server or container or VM is fungible, can be replaced at any time, everything moves toward policy-driven infrastructure. Um, but I think something that's lagged behind in this, when we think about DevOps, I think about culture automation measurement. Um, we've had the automation part of that mostly solved in terms of moving toward the cloud-native approach of cattle or of goats, if you prefer not to think about cattle that way. We've got the, the automation part mostly solved with config management, with container orchestration, with all these different tools. But where we've lagged behind most of the way until now has been the monitoring side of things. Right? Most of the monitoring tools still haven't gotten to that cloud native point where you still have you know, centralized config files, you still have the inability to do service level monitoring. What's the health of the overall service? I don't care about any individual server. And if you've heard Adrian Cockroft talk about this, he's been pushing this for a while now. Um, but most of the monitoring tools have lagged behind. But finally, that's starting to change. You know, between tools from vendors and tools uh, from the open source community, like Prometheus. And so it's good to see the monitoring side of DevOps finally catching up with the automation side of it. So this is a, an interesting example. How many of you are familiar with what happened in Knight Capital? Most of you, half of you, excellent. So I don't have to spend much time on it. But when, when they fell apart a couple years back, they fell apart because they didn't fully understand their production environment and they didn't automate the deployment process to get there. When they deployed code to, it was like seven out of their eight production servers um, to a live trading environment, managed to lose half a billion dollars in the span of 45 minutes and went out of business. And I contend that wasn't a, a failure in terms of documentation or policy or any of that. That was a failure because they didn't think about it like cattle. Right? Had they deployed to their production environment in a cattle-driven manner, they would have been fine. So where are we today in terms of DevOps? I'm gonna, I'm gonna start throwing some data at you. Well, uh, we're, we're still not too far, right? How far are we getting in terms of automation? Most IT shops today are still mostly manual, uh, which is kind of terrifying because it's just gonna mean more problems like that Knight Capital example. Although that's uh, kind of an extreme case. There are many, many changes, many, many uh, downtime issues caused by failure to fully understand and failure to fully automate the production environment and the deployment process to it. And even if we go back to ideas that are 20 years old, like Agile, I am shocked by how many people I talk to who still don't do Agile development. And I was just at a conference recently where somebody threw in Agile alongside things like cloud native and containers as a new paradigm. And I'm like, what, what have you been smoking? Because I really want some of it. And so when we look at Agile, it's still limited to something like two thirds of IT shops today. It's crazy. I and mean, I was at a conference last fall um, running this little DevOps round table. And to the last one, every single company that came to it was still doing waterfall development. And so you know, for some of the world, there's a long, long ways to go on the journey to cloud native. And it's an idea that they might hear about, but it's gonna take them at least five years to get to that point. And even if we look at DevOps, you know, things are getting farther, things are doing a little bit better. Um, you know, something like 65% of the shops are doing Agile. Um, for DevOps, it's more like 40% on average. So we're making progress toward getting there. It's finally, I think, getting to the point, you know, eight years in since we came up with the, uh, the term DevOps. It's finally reaching the mainstream, finally getting past the early adopters. Um, which changes the discussions we have, right? Suddenly it's, it's a discussion of business values instead of like, this is a really cool tech and we should totally go with it. Um, suddenly you get to a whole different level of conversation talking to you know, CIOs and VPs and all that stuff about things like I showed you at the beginning, like agility and risk and so on, um, instead of 
hey, we should definitely automate those servers. We gotta go with Ansible on this one, or whatever it is. Um, so there's still a long ways. Um, still a pretty broad spread in terms of tools, and I don't wanna get all semantic about these are or not DevOps tools, um, because those kinds of arguments are just a waste of time. But it does give you a sense there's a very broad spectrum of adoption, even within whatever you might want to call DevOps, right? Which to me is just taking Agile and applying that to iterate between the business and the customer more quickly. Um, all of this stuff falls somewhere in the middle, whether it's basic project management or whether it's um, PaaS or whether it's config management or whatever. Um, there's a very broad spread and you know, there's not really a point at which I think you get to DevOps but I do say that DevOps, from my perspective, is a prerequisite for cloud native, right? And that's why I'm talking about this stuff. You can't do cloud native effectively if you don't have the right processes, the right structure in place to support it. Otherwise, you, know, you end up in this place where the processes don't enable you to do any of the possible benefits you could have gotten out of it, and all you've done is created more work for yourself. Like I was talking to a company uh, a couple of years back, and they were really proud of themselves because they had moved to a private cloud. But what they did was they wrote their own private cloud from scratch, which first off is a terrible idea. I mean, if you want to pick a, a way to get a broken, crowd, broken cloud and no support from anybody, just write your own. And they were super excited because you know what they had done? They had moved from a provisioning time for a new VM from 60 days down to 30 days because it was all blocked by the process, right? It was all human approvals of stuff where that's no longer required once you're in even a cloud world, let alone a cloud native world of containers and uh, functions as a service. And so if you can't fix the processes, you're never gonna get any of the benefits out of it. And that's why I say DevOps is such an important prerequisite and it's not even worth having the cloud native conversation unless you're at a point where you can always do um, continuous delivery and where you have easy ways to move quickly without being blocked on other parts of the organization. And if we look at typical release speeds, again, people are still moving pretty slow, right? We're a long, long ways from you know, the euphoria of continuous delivery for most of us. And this is another one of those things where if you can't do continuous delivery, you can't really and effectively have the cloud native conversation. And so the only people who can really have these conversations, right? You can't, the weekly folks, they're on their way. The monthly folks, they've got some changes to make. Um, the quarterly folks, and, and slower than that, you know, it's, again, one of those things where it's years out for them to get here. Um, and so it's unfortunate, but until we can get most of those people in the middle much farther to the left toward at least that daily release pace, which means they fixed the processes, right? If you can release daily, you fixed all the processes that are blocking you from speed. Um, and then you can start having that cloud-native conversation, being able to move, um, you know, as quickly as you want to. Um, and so now let's move on to the container discussion as we move farther into the cloud native concepts and prerequisites and ideas. I wanted to show you some data from a few different data sources on what's going on in terms of container adoption. Um, and I don't expect you to be able to read the key or even really see the lines on this. Um, I'm just making a couple of key points, so don't worry too much if you can't read it. So I, I dug into Stack Overflow, a pretty popular developer discussion forum, and they make this cool data explorer available. So you can go basically write SQL queries and look for anything you want to. Um, and so I went and looked for tagged questions per month over time over, um, I mean, the important part is the three or so years on the right part of it. Um, and you can see that, you know, we've had containers as an idea for decades at this point. It's not a new thing, but what changed was it suddenly became really easy to use. Um, the barrier to entry got a lot lower because of the usability crisis um, and because of you know, the ability to combine a bunch of different kernel features into um, something that was pretty straightforward in terms of using it. And so Docker did a great credit to the community for doing so and enabled all of this stuff to start moving on, enabled the conversation to move forward. And as you can see here, it's, it's blown up, right? The container conversation has gone from zero to a million in the span of the past few years. And the other interesting point is, and we're gonna get more into this later, is what's happening in terms of dealing with those containers at, at scale. And the second most popular line on here is Kubernetes, right? Yay, go Cloud Native Computing Foundation. And so we're seeing you know, emerging traction for the container orchestration part of things too. 
But it's not just developers, and this is the thing I always get concerned about when we start hearing hype behind trends is, all right, it's a bunch of vendors pushing something, nobody using it in the real world. Or it's a bunch of developers playing around with toys, and no companies are really implementing this stuff in production. And so that's where I went back to our data, where we survey a bunch of IT shops and start looking at things over time um, and start looking at things at scale, talking to the sort of senior IT crowd, in addition to being able to look at the developer side of things. Um, and this is uh, the first time I've shown the latest data set on here, which is looking at container adoption over time. So you go from early 2015, where I think one of the interesting parts of this is if you look at the initial and broad production, right? You can combine those and say, all right, how many IT decision makers say their, their company has containerized apps in prod? About 6% pretty small, but reflects relatively closely um, things like the release speed that I was showing you earlier. Um, fast forward six months later last year, all of that doubled, right? So container adoption was moving really fast. We got up to something like uh, just over 14% of shops able to have containerized apps in prod and a bunch more who were had them in POCs and dev test and somewhere around there. Um, but what started to be interesting was this change that you can see happening at the discovery and eval phase and the no plans phase, which gave you some early clues of the community and the population of users starting to segment themselves out in a couple of different camps. And if we fast forward again to the latest data, you see even more of that, right? So we're, we're kind of stuck right now at about 14% of the shops that have containerized apps in prod. Um, I suspect this is related to things like a release speed, like not getting all the prerequisites in place um, to be able to do containerized apps. But what's interesting is this, this shift that's happening at the discovery and eval phase and the no plans phase. And how I'm interpreting this is there's an increasing number of people who looked at containers and said, we're not ready yet. Right? So they, they spent some time investigating them and they said, hey, this is, this is kind of cool stuff, but we don't see the value at this point. Um, and one of the reasons I contend why they're not seeing the value, um, and we've actually asked about this in the survey too, what are the technology blockers, what are the technology drivers, all that good stuff, business blockers, business drivers. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of that, but not a lot of it. Um, one of the big issues is lack of expertise, right? They just can't find the people, they can't train the people. Um, in many cases, the documentation isn't up to speed, so they can't even learn it themselves. Um, and it's a real big limit on being able to get this stuff going out there. Right? There's just not enough knowledge being shared um, across the community at this point to enable people who know nothing about it to really get up and running. I mean, that's one of the big problems I think we have in, in technology today is we've got the in crowd of people who all know everything about what's going on. I call it the Silicon Valley bubble, but it goes beyond the valley, right? It's the global tech community um, of sort of the elites, if you will, compared to everybody else. And it's critical that we spend more time sharing knowledge outside of this community, right? Like go home, if you live somewhere besides the Valley, go home and go speak at local like IT meetups and that kind of thing about what's cloud native, why is it valuable, how do you get there? Um, and that's one of those critical steps that has to happen for this to really get out the door and to become popular. Um, and so, let's pop through all that good stuff again. So like I said, about 15% or so, maybe one in seven-ish shops have containerized apps in prod. About a third of them are at the point of playing around, um, which is pretty good considering some of the graph I was just showing you. This has gone from, like I said, zero to 60 in the span of just a couple of years. And it's very rare for any kind of new technology to get into this many enterprises that fast. Um, and so just a little more data on the kinds of things that are happening out there with containers. Um, we spend a lot of time thinking about what's the right place to run a lot of workloads, um, the, what's the multi-cloud, hybrid cloud feature, all that jazz. And so we go out there and ask people, well, where are you running your containers today? Um, most of them, it turns out today, are running them at home, basically, right, on-prem, private cloud. Um, not as many in the public cloud. And this is already kind of a surprise, right? Like, when you think about where most people would be running their production container apps, um, I would kind of expect it to be in a public cloud environment. Uh, but it turns out that's not the case. Um, same thing if you ask people where they think they're going to be in a couple of years. And I'm always a little bit leery of this stuff because everybody's more optimistic than uh, they have any right to be. So everybody says, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll be microservices in two years. No problem. It's going to be everything. All of our apps are going to be rewritten, and it's going to be amazing and magical future. 
But we do see a lot more people saying, hey, we're going to shift from the on-prem private cloud stuff um, to adding a lot more things that live elsewhere. Um, this is another one I found interesting. You know, I had this preconception um, cons with the way people would run containers that pretty much everybody would just slap one in a VM, right? Because we have a lot of discussions about containers and security right now, um, and a lot of people are unclear on whether containers are sufficiently secure compared to VMs or whatever else. Um, and so, you know, we wanted to go out there and ask, how are you handling this stuff? What are you doing with containers relative to VMs? And gave them three options which number one was basically, this is a new workload, has nothing to do with VMs, isn't stealing uh, an app that used to run in a VM before. Number two was, you, know, you slap it right into a VM. Number three was you're migrating stuff over. And I was really surprised to see that it was a pretty notable split across those. There wasn't one dominant approach. People are running containers in a lot of different ways. Um, and some of them, you know, like I said, are essentially a cloud native style workload. Um, some of them are basically, let's lift and shift into a container, and now we're cloud native, right? Turns out it's not quite that easy, and in fact, you've just made your problems worse because you've moved something that requires hardware redundancy to an environment that's software redundancy. Now you just have more downtime. And in terms of what people are doing with the containerized apps, um, from my perspective, it's mostly infrastructure-led right now, and we asked people about like 20 or so different kinds of workloads. Uh, but it's, it's mostly the stuff that's like web servers, app dev, that kind of thing. Um, no huge surprises here in retrospect, uh, but it's always easy to have 20-20 hindsight. There aren't many people putting their SAP in a container right now. Let's, let's put it that way. I saw them uh, throw a tweet into the Cloud Native Day hashtag about we can run on cloud. I'm like, well, yeah, but I'm not sure you're cloud native yet. And so bringing that together, the discussions we've had over the course of this talk so far, um, you've got fragmentation being a really important driving force from my perspective. Combine that with companies that have meet, met the prerequisite of getting DevOps in place, um, taking those containers out, and you end up with microservices. And I don't think I need to define it or spend much time on it, but I did want to, again, show a little bit more data on what people are doing out there. And this isn't intended by any means to be an all-inclusive slide. This is just examples of some of the kinds of software that people are using to try and implement microservices, I mean, especially the sort of roll your own variety, because I'm not gonna talk much about the whole PaaS side of things here, although I'm sure you're familiar with many of them. And so going back to our Stack Overflow data, um, what I did on this slide is I just dropped Docker, because it's so far off the scale that you can't even really tell what's happening with anything else, um, and left, kept everything else in. And what you can see is, again, the same thing, Kubernetes is doing pretty well among those container orchestration style tools, uh, but, the other ones are by no means dead, right? Mesos is still doing reasonably well down there in that kind of brownish yellow line. Uh, Docker Swarm is that yellow, uh, bright yellow line, starting to pick up pretty quick now that it's come out. Um, and there's a lot of other options kind of floating around too. And I put this up here, um, especially I wanted to point out that Docker Swarm part, to make the point that there's never a point at which the game is won and it's over and we can say, all right, Kubernetes has won, we're good now. Um, there's always gonna be you know, new options emerging that mean everybody has to continue to keep up and innovate, right? You can't say like, all right, we're, we're done with Kubernetes, we finished, day, done, day over, job done. Um, you gotta keep moving forward, otherwise you, know, you become the one who gets disrupted. And then if we tie that into the survey data, um, you know, we went out there, and like I showed you earlier, about 15% of IT shops have containerized apps in prod, according to the survey. Um, the interesting part is many of them are not doing anything that I would call cloud native, right? They're still taking pet style applications and just throwing them in a container and rolling it out. Because if you ask, are you using container orchestration, and you compare that 15% to this 9%, you see, only about two-thirds of them are managing containers in a way that I would consider sane. Um, the other third are just kind of you know, doing some weird cowboy stuff. And so you know, it's taken a long time, even for companies that are getting to the container point, to move to that next step and get to something that's closer to cloud native. And so in the last few minutes, I just wanted to talk through a few real-world examples of companies that have done this stuff. Um, how many of you are familiar with the Halo microservices shift? Not that many, I'm surprised. It's good stuff. They've got a bunch of talks out there. They've been talking at uh, reInvent for a while now. 
And one of the people who was behind it actually moved to uh, start his own startup, uh, building out microservices frameworks. And so Halo is, is essentially the equivalent of Uber, but for black cabs in London um, and some other cities. And they moved everything over to microservices because they were running into these problems where they just couldn't move quickly because the architecture was too complex. And they wanted to get rid of single points of failure and move to a more resilient environment. And the interesting thing, the thing I'm showing you on this graph is uh, there's two lines on here. One of them, the red one, is the cost per job that they're running in their, in their cluster. And the blue line is the number of total jobs completed. And you may or may not be able to see, but there's a vertical line right in the middle there, which is when they made that flip over to microservices. And the interesting thing was they didn't just see improvements in efficiency, getting rid of single points of failure, being able to move quicker. They saw economic improvements too, right? Their cost per job, that red line, went down dramatically after they made the, the move. Um, because they were able to make more efficient use of the infrastructure they already had instead of set, having it sitting around, right? So it's just another step in that um, iterative process of moving more toward uh, the cattle style model, the cloud native model, even the functions as a service model. And just to kind of flip through the architecture, you know, they used to have the good old classic stack, moved to something that's much more distributed, right? Um, added, added Go, because you can't be cool if you don't do Go, um, and, and some other things. And if you look at the overall microservices infrastructure, um, all the service connectivity, it turns into this big mess. And in fact, this is not uncommon. Almost everybody who's implemented microservices ends up with a big mess. Um, complexity is the new normal, and the challenge is coming up with the right sets of tooling to be able to cope with that. Um, things like distributed tracing tooling, things like modern service level monitoring, policy-driven infrastructure, all this stuff is critical for companies um, who are trying to do this so that they can effectively deal with all the crap. Um, so one more example, and then I'm gonna close with one final example and uh, show you a little bit of data. So realestate.com.au, pretty popular real estate site in Australia. And they pulled in ThoughtWorks to help them transition over to microservices. Um, again, for many of the same reasons around getting rid of single points of failure, being unable to move quickly because they had to get too many approvals across the organization to make a, a change in one single piece of software. And the important point from this one, and the point that I want to emphasize is this isn't like a two-day, two-week, or two-month journey. This is more like a two-year journey. Um, they did a talk a while back where they published how many microservices they had successfully implemented over time, and it took them two years to get to the point of getting to 60 microservices up there, two years to get to the point of fully replacing everything they had already had. Um, so it's not an overnight process. It's you know, more of a strategic investment, and when you're talking to your companies or your clients' companies about this stuff, I think it's important to emphasize that this is a strategic investment that will take a while to show the dividends. Um, this isn't a flip it in a quarter type thing. We're not day trading with microservices. Um, the final example, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I'm running out of time here, um, is uh, basically the Chinese kayak. Right? They moved to microservices. Um, the difference that's interesting in the way they did it was they took kind of an inverse Conway's Law approach um, in which they said, we're gonna take our existing architecture and essentially segment it by business unit, by the business units we already have, um, instead of trying to reorganize everything and do microservices that way. So you can see they had the old monolith um, broken into four main chunks. Now it's exactly the same, microservices in four main chunks. And did what's becoming an increasingly common pattern. I think one of the important things that's starting to happen now is a lot of microservices frameworks are emerging. Um, things like, I think you're gonna hear about Mantle later on, right? More and more of these are, are coming out as we realize what are the critical components and dependencies required to do microservices, and we don't all need to re-implement them every time we do it. And so in closing, you know, the last data point I wanna show you is that we're seeing more and more interest in this cloud native idea out there in the real world, but it's still early days, right? There are a lot of companies that haven't met the prerequisites yet um, that are doing much more legacy driven things with their cloud platforms, running old, st old school workloads, web apps, um, migrating legacy workloads to the cloud, um, but not ready for cloud native yet. But it is just in its starting days and I think it's gonna go far.
And with that, thank you for your time.